All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Minneapolis African American Community Engagement Series. My name is Antonia Wilcoxon, and I'm a consultant with Equity Strategies and your facilitator tonight. Thank you for being here. This is the fifth in a series of Minneapolis African American Community Engagement, a citywide engagement for a Minneapolis African American historic and cultural context study. The city of Minneapolis hired a consultant team comprised of Lane Johnson De Development, Equity Strategies, and the 106 group to conduct citywide community outreach on the needs and wants of the African American community relative to heritage pre preservation. Mr. Robert Skalecki is a city planner and in the historic preservation, the city of Minneapolis. And I'd like to ask you if you'd please um, speak a little bit about this project. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Antonia. Um, hello, everyone. And as Antonia mentioned, my name is Rob Skalecki. I'm a city planner in the historic preservation section of the planning department of the city of Minneapolis. Um, this talk tonight, as well as the others that have happened previously, um, is part of the National Trust for Historic Preservation's African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund grant project, which uh, the city received last year. So this has been an ongoing project, and this is the fifth um, talk that we're having tonight related to this grant. Um, I would ask if you do have any questions about this project um, after this, after tonight, or at any time in the future, I'm going to leave my contact information in the chat for you to reach out, ask any questions that you would like. Um, but with that, I'll pass it back to Antonia. Thank you. Thank you. We're a joint group of three organizations coming together. And I would like to invite Judge Lajun Lane to the lead organization, Lane Johnson Development, to say a few words. Good afternoon or good evening, everyone. African Americans have been in the Minnesota Territory for decades before the territory was formed and decades before Minnesota became a state. The African American people were traders, business owners, uh, shopkeepers, builders, and elected officials. We see bits and pieces of our history from Fort Snelling to uh, Minneapolis, but there's no cohesive documentation of our presence for the hundreds of years that we have been in Minnesota. So this project is attempting to be able to do a survey from the 1800s through the present of important places, people, buildings, and uh, things of special interest so that we have a cohesive document to give to the city of Minneapolis for further research. So we welcome all of you. We welcome you sharing your knowledge and your ideas, and we look forward to our discussion this evening. Thank you, Judge. Ms. Erin Kay is a senior architectural historian for the 106 group. And I'd like to ask if she would introduce herself and say a few words about this project as well. Thank you. Thank you, Antonia, all for being here. So as Antonia said, I'm a senior architectural historian and my role on this project is to provide support related to heritage preservation practices. And when we talk about heritage preservation or historic preservation, that really means documenting conserving and also protecting places that are important to our history. And there are several ways that we can do that. One would be listing places on the National Register of Historic Places, designating a place as a local landmark, telling stories through exhibits, and also much more. And I'm sure you'll have ideas to share over the course of this evening. We acknowledge that the National Register of Historic Places, as well as the current list of local landmarks in Minneapolis, overwhelmingly focus on the contributions of white individuals as well as events associated with white history. And as a result, these lists do not fully represent Minneapolis's history. 
We also recognize that many places that are associated with African-American heritage in Minneapolis have been lost or erased due to intentional arson, construction of interstates, urban renewal initiatives, among other factors. And with tonight's focus on sites of consciousness and places associated with memory, it's also important for us to rethink what defines a historic place um, and perhaps transcend those traditional concepts. So as Judge Lang said, through this series of community engagement sessions, we are hoping to significantly expand the existing narrative and we'll also provide the city with your input about how you'd like African-American heritage to be preserved. A list and a map of places in the city that are associated with African-American contributions to history as well as important events and a draft outline for a historic context study that will provide a framework for the future preservation of these important places. So thank you again for being here with us. I'm gonna put a link in a chat in the chat to our project page. And then later this evening, we'll also invite you um, to submit places that you think are important either in the chat or through an online submission form. Thank you, Erin. Our thanks to our technical administrators for this evening event and they have been each night uh, Mr. Emery Carter and Mr. Jonathan Carter, they orchestrate the music we hear and the informative slides we will see throughout our meeting tonight. Our thanks to them. It is my pleasure to introduce you to tonight's panelists for the theme. How can the Minneapolis African American community identify people places and buildings that are so seared into the consciousness of the black community that they should be formal recognition for future generations and visitors. What should be saved and protected? And I'd like to start by introducing Ms. Tracy Williams Dillard. Hard work and dedication to her multi-generational family, generational family and family business has always been her main focus. Ms. Williams Diller has the awesome responsibility of running the day-to-day -day operations of the Minnesota Spokesman Recorder, as well as providing leadership direction to move the business forward. Her vision, passion and commitment to take the newspaper into the future are the main reasons that it continues to this day, more than eight decades since its founding. She has a solid understanding of the beliefs and values of her grandfather, the late Cecil E. Newman, who founded the newspaper in 1934, and she's committed to continuing his legacy. At the tender age of eight, Ms. Williams Diller became her work at the paper, working odd jobs, including mastering and operating the address of graph machine, which sits in the front lobby today. Later, she worked as a receptionist and billing clerk, and eventually moved on to advertising sales. During the same period, she found time to pursue other areas of interest, including chemical dependency counseling. And as such, she did internship at the Institute of Black Chemical Abuse and attended classes at the Minneapolis Community and Technical College, majoring in counseling. Later, Ms. Williams Diller moved to Des Moines, Iowa, where she worked in the accounting and human resource departments at Ardennes, a large retail outlet. Ms. Williams Diller returned to Minneapolis and worked at the Chevrolet dealership as a billing clerk. In 1990, she accepted a full-time position with the Minnesota Spokesman Recorder as an advertising representative and office manager. Since that time, she has focused much of her efforts on strengthening the advertising area, sales area of the business. In 2001, Ms. Williams Diller became the president and chief economic officer of the 85-year-old community newspaper. 
2006, she became owner and the chief executive officer of the weekly publication. In addition to her leadership at the paper, Ms. williams Dealer has served on several local boards, such as the Boys and Girls Club, Minneapolis NAACP, Southside Community Collaborative, African American AIDS Project, Twin Cities African American Leadership Forum, PPT Television, Sister Spokesman, and Global Women's Network. She's also a member of the board of directors for her newspaper, the Minnesota Spokesman Recorder, and is the president of the nonprofit arm, the Spokesman Recorder Nonprofit. In 2006, she started a women's group called Sister Spokesman that provides women of color a monthly opportunity to meet, network, and learn from a wide range of guest speakers and expert panelists and promote and support new women-owned business ventures. After 15 years, the group continues to grow with the current monthly attendance averaging 75 to 100 participants. One of Ms. Williams' daily proudest accomplishment is having launched the Spokesman Recorder annual graduation celebration, a family affair. In 1995, which every spring provided a free dinner, inspirational speakers and entertainment to graduating seniors of African and African-American descent and their families. These events celebrate the community's youth and their families for achieving their educational milestone and emphasizes to the rest of the community the great importance of education to the future of Black Americans. Thousands of young people and their families have benefited from this annual event, and hundreds of youth have received scholarships to continue their education. Ms. Williams Dealer was involved in kickboxing as a hobby, is an avid move, movie watcher and enjoys bowling, fishing, and playing cards. When she's not busy with all of these activities, she enjoys spending quality time with um, her daughters and myriad friends at their home in Burnsville, Minnesota. This is Ms. Tracy Williams Dillard, and I will next read a bio from Ms. Amel Reeves. Ms. Amel Reeves is the community editor for the Minnesota Spokesman Recorder, celebrating 85 years as one of the oldest African American newspapers in the US. Ms. Reeves is a human rights activist and journalist. He has been actively involved in the struggles to promote social justice and human rights for over 30 years, either writing about them, organizing, or doing both. He began fighting for racial justice while serving as a racial justice coordinator for clergy and laity concerned and took on issues of race, including fighting South African apartheid. He fought, fought for his school desegregation, was active in pushing the lawsuit in the middle mid 1990s, seeking integration of Minneapolis and suburban school districts. He helped organize the effort to secure a civilian review board in 1991. He also worked to get justice for the workers during the embassy suites 11 in 1991. He organized the effort to get justice for Tysel Nelson, who was shot and killed by Minneapolis police officer Dan May in December 1990. And he worked to bring justice in a myriad of cases following Nelson's death. More recently, he was involved in organizing the effort to get justice for Terence Franklin, Jamar Clark, Philando Castillo, George Floyd, Dante Wright, and Winston, Winston Smith. He created the Take a New Nation organization to highlight the problem of police violence as seen through the eyes of the families of the victim. In 2018, he organized the Take a Knee conference in Minneapolis 
the weekend that the Super Bowl was held here, highlighting the struggles of a few dozen families. On the heels of the murder of George Floyd, he helped organize the Mother's March, which brought in hundreds of families to the Twin Cities. We stand in solidarity with George Floyd's family and families who lost a loved one to police violence. He fought gentrification and the displacement of residents who lived in high rises in what is now known as Heritage Park in the year 2000. He worked with the Occupy movement and eventually Occupy Homes in the Twin Cities, which successfully saved many homes from foreclosure. He has worked with activists and alumni to prevent the closing of Minneapolis North High School in 2011. Mr. Reeves has written dozens of articles exposing and highlighting injustices in the Twin Cities. He wrote a column for the uh, Minnesota Spokesman and Recorder for over 20 years. He worked as a consultant and organizer with Hire Minnesota to get the construction industry to hire more people of color in publicly funded construction projects. He was a member of the International Association of Machinists and supported union organizing efforts and stood with fellow workers on dozens of picket lines. And he has answered the call for help and aided the organizing in dozens of cases involving injustice in the Twin Cities over the years. This is Mr. Mel Reeves. I will now uh, read a bio for Ms. Angela Rose Myers, and then we'll listen from our three panel members. Ms. Angela Rose Myers graduated from Barnard College of Columbia University in New York City. A Twin Cities native, she returned to Minneapolis looking to make a change, her community through meaningful relationship building, an honest commitment to equality and empowering young women to be the change they want to see. She's currently pursuing her master's degree in human rights at the University of Minnesota. After being connected with the Minneapolis NAACP, she quickly rose to the position of second vice president at the age of 23, and then was elected president of the Minneapolis NAACP in November 2020 at 25 years of age, making one of her of the youngest NAACP adult branch presidents in the nation. She has worked with and built relationships with many local community groups on issues of civic engagement like Minnesota Voice, Black Votes Matter Minnesota, ACER, ACLU Minnesota, national groups like the National Organization for Women and Action, National Action Network. She has traveled around the world engaging scholars on social justice issues and public policy, most notably helping coordinate the Fifth World Conference on Remedies to Race and Ethnic Economic Inequalities in Victoria, Brazil. So these are our three speakers for this evening. And again, uh, with our gratitude, um, again, I will read the focus question in which we have asked the speakers to comment on. They will have 20 minutes each. So this is what we are asking of the um, panel. How can Minneapolis African-American community identify people, places, and buildings that are so seared into the consciousness of the Black community that there should be formal recognition future generations and for future generations and visitors. What should be saved and protected? How should we save and protect these? Well, I don't know. It's not your fault. And um, one of one of the things um, that you know, I first of all want to start off by thanking Lejeune for asking me to be on and for the rest of the panel and and everyone that's involved, Dr. 
uh, Antonio to, to ask me to be on to speak today. It, it, historic preservation is so important, especially when I look at um, the historic areas that we have just in South Minneapolis. It's, you know, it, it, the number as I was really, after I was asked to be on this panel today, I started because we're in the thick of things as a newspaper, we're constantly writing about different uh, historical events that take place and a lot of things that are going on that certainly Mel's going to probably talk a lot about today because he's at the helm of making sure these articles are, are, are written and, and pre presented in the right way. But when you just to look at some of the historical buildings that we've identified over the years, um, it's so important that we preserve them because I've even had some of the young people in our neighborhood come by the paper and they and the doors open and they see somebody standing at the front counter and they'll stop and they'll go so come in I'll, I'll actually beckon them to come in I'll be like come on in because I want to educate and inform them and they'll come in and they'll go so what is this place and I go okay well this is the black press this is the Minnesota spokesman recorder have you ever heard of it and it gives me an opportunity and these are not all just African-American children, but they certainly include African-American children. Um, it gives me that opportunity to educate them on the black press and that, you know, that we've been there for 87 years and that my grandfather Cecil Newman began the paper in 1934. And it really impresses them, you know, when they hear just how old the paper is and how long it's been around. And then I think, just to know that the paper exists right in their neighborhood. It's like one young Latino guy lives right across the street and he came over and spent 20 minutes while I talked to him about the paper and the importance and the work that we do and the history of, you know, my family running it, you know, my grandfather began it and my grandmother took it over. And then my mother and my uncle, uh, Norma Williams and Jack Jackman, they took they took the helm from with my grandmother and then ultimately um i got involved at a very early age and towards my grandmother deciding to uh turn the helm over turn it over to me so being able to share that history with the community at large but also the younger people it, it just shows the importance in our history being preserved and and we were fortunate enough and i think a lot of these other landmarks that we're going to talk about tonight need to you know obviously be able to be registered as historical landmarks so that we can be so we can preserve the locations we again were fortunate enough to be uh, designated as a as a twin city landmark uh, minnesota landmark um now we're looking at making sure that we're also the registry for the you know for the national landmark so when people come to Minnesota, they, you know, are also familiar with all the African American landmarks that are here today, that they can actually go and visit, whether they can visit inside the, the facilities or whether it's them driving by the facility. Um, nonetheless, they still are able to see the historical landmarks that we have, and that's very important. And so some of the ones that we focused in on, because we've actually did a calendar, so this was kind of exciting to talk about this today, um, just to kind of re reiterate the kind of the landmarks that we looked at in Minneapolis at the time, and it's only 12 that we could focus in on. Um, but just to mention a few, and I know that uh, there's some others that will probably be mentioned um, throughout the conversation, but, you know, just starting off with like the uh, Martin Luther King Park. And one of the things that when we first got a call, you know, three, four years back, they were talking about taking our heritage, once again, our history of the civil rights movement and all the things that Martin Luther King stood for that the park represents and has some landmark uh, conversations throughout the park. At that time, they were thinking about making it a dog park. And it's like, how, how can it possibly, the Martin Luther King Park be chosen to become a dog park? That, that it was mind blowing. And so fortunately, the community wasn't trying to have it and the community got behind it and rallied. 
and made sure that that absolutely did not happen, that it was not going to be created into a dog park. And it, and so now when you're able to go through the park, Martin Luther King Park on 43rd and Nicollet, you can see the historical different landmarks of, of the civil rights and different things that African-Americans have contributed to the history of Martin Luther King and to our history as Black history. And so it's an important landmark that maintains in South Minneapolis so that even the young people back to young people because they're our future when we look at the young people that actually visit Martin Luther King Park now and they're able to you know with some some guidance or not depending on how uh, how interested they are in looking at the signs that are there but if they aren't and they got a guide guide there that helps to read the different this train this this different um, artifacts that are there that describe the historical pre preservations that happened that are tied into Martin Luther King and why it's important that that park exists. It gives them that history that they would not have otherwise, first of all, would have not even had an opportunity to get had the park been turned into a dog park. But then secondly, with them building all these different uh, artifacts to show the different things that African Americans contributed to the history of South Minneapolis, in addition to the history of Martin Luther King, I think is very important. So that was a part that um, I'm glad that was reserved and that this has that history. And then even up the street from that park um, is another historical, which is on 46 and Columbus, and um, it actually is a, a house that it was the first African Americans that actually moved into the neighborhood, and they had to. Uh, they went through a lot of, of of discrimination, and and people tried uh, a, lot, a lot of white supremacists and a lot of different organizations that didn't want African Americans in the neighborhood. Tried extremely hard to get them out and they fought and they stood strong and they did not end up losing their home or moving out of the neighborhood. And it's the Lee family monument that opened up the gates to a lot of African-Americans to live in the homes, in the neighborhood. And actually I, I may have cited that address wrong. It's actually 46 Columbus where the house still stands and you can go by and see the monument on the front yard. And again, that's another way of letting our community know that that house, house exists. And a little bit about, you know, what it's about on the sign that sits in the yard. And, you know, it, it's got the Arthur Lee, which was in July when he was born in July of July 16th of 1931, when he got this home. And the home is now a, a, another landmark and it actually is a national landmark. So when people come to Minnesota, I was just talking to a young lady that came by the spokesman that's in town. She was just in town touring again, African-American landmarks, which some are noted and some aren't, but she came in town and wanted to look around and she found out about the spokesman and came by and was talking to me. And she was on her way up to, to the George Floyd uh, square, which we'll talk just a minute about that, but she wanted to know about some other landmarks and she did know about the Lee family landmark home. So again, just knowing that there was in this neighborhood, African-American family that had to go through a lot of injustice just to have a home because they were the first African-Americans that moved into the community in 1931 and really this was um, at that time that was an all white community unheard of for a black family to move in in a house um again a, a very important landmark but at this point it has been preserved as far as a landmark for it to be historical and nationally known landmark and it's also got the memorial out in the front yard so that's just a few ways that we can start to preserve our history. But in addition to that, is just making sure that if it's down at City Hall, that it's in a hallway and a plaque so as kids do their field trips are familiar with that, um, as well as just being able to see it in 
the paper that we, as we run through, you know, Martin Luther King Black History Month and always mentioning our landmarks that we have in Minnesota that people don't even know about, that live here all their lives and weren't even aware of it. So another landmark that is definitely important that we keep in the books. Then of course, then we have ours truly, the Minnesota Spokesman Recorder, which I've talked a little bit about in the beginning and how we have um, been around since 1934, a historical landmark within the black community. And it's one of the few um, buildings that still stand that once the corner of 38th and 4th Avenue was all black owned businesses there. And we're still trying to figure out how to bring that conversation back on 38th Street. So we're, we're working on the 38th Street corridor and trying to figure out how we can make sure that the black history of that biz, that the businesses are not forgotten. So that's another project that the um, city of Minneapolis with uh, Andrea's leadership is trying to work through. So that's another landmark, which we're viewing right now of the Minnesota Spokesman Reporter. And then of course we have the Minnesota uh, African American Museum, which um, is over in North Minneapolis that we definitely, I know they're at the 1256 building um, right now. They may be housed in a different location in the future, but again, another historical place that or or organization and, and, and artifacts that are in there that we can't forget because they represent the black community and African history in Minnesota. And you can go in and see some really cool things. Again, making sure that that history isn't lost because they did start working on pulling a lot of nice things together for people to see, be able to do tours, to know that we have black history in Minnesota because a lot of people still think, you got black people in Minnesota? Absolutely we do. And they've got a lot of great history. So we wanna make sure that our locations like the African-American Museum aren't forgotten that they are a part of our history. And um, it's just a lot of different areas that we have that we want to make sure that we don't forget and that we keep them in our, in our, in our eyesight so that they are, are preserved. Because if things get forgotten, it's just like the golf course, and that was the last one I'll talk about right now, is the Hiawatha Golf Course. And we just recently wrote some articles on that as well because they were looking at taking that golf course park a golf course away and it's been historically a black golf course there on cedar and 46 for years and they were looking at trying to take that away and, and and cut it down to so many little holes and which at that point wouldn't be much of a significance in having it as a golf course and the community got behind it once again the community has a lot of power in terms of making sure that you know that their voices are heard and then it helps when they have media that gets behind it as well to help amplify their voice and really get it out there and let people know they care about these, organ these organizations or these sites or these places that mean a lot to them and that we don't lose sight with them and that we don't lose them and that we don't turn them into dog parks or different things that aren't relevant to our heritage and our history. So it's important that we maintain the history and the integrity of Black uh, history, African American history, and I'm glad that the city is looking at helping us to make sure that that happens. Thank you, Ms. Williams Dealer. If uh, we could have Ms. Mel Reeves um, comment a bit on. Uh... Hello. Good evening. Um, I, when I, I was presented with this, I, I thought about uh, uh, a lot of things. In fact, I was telling Tracy about um, visiting Denver, and they had um, there was a spot uh, on the edge of downtown Denver where they try to recognize the accomplishments of uh, Black people who have come before. Um, you know, this is a uh, this is I think an, an important task because. You know, Minneapolis is not known on some level. It's a place where black people, you know, reside. You know, a lot of people are surprised that oh, black people in Minnesota is like yes. Um, and so when when you asked me to do this, I thought, well, you know, I'm I'm kind of not a place person. I'm more of a people person. I can tell you about people and events and you know places uh, come and go for me. But uh, what sticks out in my memory are are, are people and, and events. And um, so I thought I'd try to to. Uh, 
um, help kind of add to this conversation by thinking about my own experience and people I've run across who I think have made a significant uh, con contribution to uh, being black in, in, in Minnesota. Um, but I think that there ought to be some way of, uh, like, like in, in Denver, Dallas, Denver rather, you know, they have these markers that talk about, you know, and the markers aren't necessarily, don't necessarily they correspond with something that happened there, but they have markers that talk about, uh, you know, uh, when black people first arrived in, in Denver, uh, what they did, you know, the very first churches, first establishments, and um, these markers are like lined down the street, and you can, you know, visit the markers and get a good sense of of the history of uh, black folks in Denver, because you know, when you think of Denver, you don't think of a lot of black folks there either, but they've tried to deal with it by having a little, and I think. So when I'm talking, I'm talking about ideas I think we can do. I think we should, I don't know how we do it, but I think we should find some space, someplace maybe downtown and into downtown, at the South Minneapolis, maybe near the spokesman on 38th and 4th, uh, maybe a pen in Plymouth, uh, somewhere near there. I uh, have some markers or, or, or when people come to town, they get a sense of uh, the history of uh, black folks in this town. Um, so for me, you know, I, my history goes, uh, 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 harkens back to I'm one of the people who immigrated and migrated to uh, the Twin Cities. And I think that should be part of the story. Uh, a lot of folks have migrated here um, from all over. And we know a good number of people have come here from Illinois, probably from uh, Chicago more specifically. But, uh, you know, when the factories closed down in Gary, uh, I think people came here from Gary and Detroit. Um, they also came from points uh, south. Uh, I have friends from Kansas City, St. Louis. I personally am from Miami. Um, and so there, I think the, the story has to, when we talk about historical markers and that kind of thing, we have to include the story of the folks who come here and came here and, did, and, and, and made good for themselves and uh, contributed to Black Minneapolis. Um, and so I think it should, and that should be something that, that's included. And I think, you know, kind of, the great migration that we had may have begun probably in the late 70s. Um, I got here in 80, 80 81 myself. Um, I came here from Miami through Iowa, went to college in Iowa. Um, and so a lot of folks were uh, from uh, someplace else, so much so that, you know, there was just the dichotomy on some other people who were native Minnesotans, uh, native Minneapolis, or St. Paulites, uh, and folks who come from someplace else. But at the end of the day, uh, folks came and created this melting pot. And then the other part that needs to be told is the uh, the uh, migration uh, or immigration of of our West African and, and East African brothers and sisters. I think that has to be part of the story as well. Um, and so I think about uh, people when I got here who uh, influenced folks uh, quite a bit. And uh, when you tell our story, you have to include them. Uh, and I think people like uh, Mahmoud El Khati who, uh, you know, is a professor, a historian. Uh, but back in the 80s and early 90s, um, he did some very interesting things. He taught history in the community, which we don't have as much anymore. But I think it was significant because uh, the history classes that he taught, uh, a Sealy Institute is something he started. Some of you all may be familiar with it, um, in which um, he began to bring people together uh, around culture and history and it, it with the people who took these classes who were part of the institute you know had their the self-esteem built up on some level uh so he's somebody that should be included in and in, and in, in we're looking at the history and of course it's not going way back but i'm going back to as far as i know um um i, I think of uh, nelly stone johnson um she was a uh, uh some level historian as well labor historian so she should be included in whatever we're doing. I'm sure that name's not unfamiliar to folks. Uh, uh, there's an elementary school, I think two named after her and rightfully so, because she was a very hard worker and um, she was important because she reminded people of the connection that black people are working class people, black people are working people. Um, um, I think, you know, we've got to include Harry Spike Moss uh, who's a walking, you know, he's walking history. So am I too at this, at this age. So some of this stuff, I just know because I was there, but, um, you know, I wasn't there when I think, um, uh, the very important events happened on Plymouth Avenue. You know, we talk about the riots and what have you, but, you know, you think about the fact that a riot occurred on Plymouth Avenue, that people had to get to the point where they had to riot. That says there's something, you know, pretty bad was going on that, that, that people had to get to that point. But out of those sprang some pretty good stuff. In fact, 
uh, the way is one of the things that that sprang out of the riots, and should get you know should get credit for his activism. Uh, and his advocacy for young people. Because um, when I got here, uh, he was highly, highly, highly respected uh, for his work with uh, young people. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, uh, there were two way buildings. Um, yeah, yes. And so, right. And so now there'd be three, because that's one of the original building. Uh, then the other one moved further down Plymouth. And now it's a... Uh, um, it's like a, I can't think of what they, she uses it for, but it's it's a place where I think older people uh, live or or that they're doing the day. I'm not sure, and that's off Plymouth, and it's still a nice looking building. And I, I, I you know I don't know if it's possible to buy that building from the, the person who bought it, but you know that's a landmark. Uh, also, the the four precinct was, if I'm not mistaken, it was a way building as well. And uh, we got that taken away from us on some level because, you know, as I say to people all the time, you have to be careful what you ask for, because a lot of people were saying that, hey, you know, we need more of a police presence in North Minneapolis. And so the power structure said, OK. And since the way building, I think, was owned by some foundation, a philanthropic organization, they were able to turn it over to the city. Um, and, uh, you know, after they did that, they were. In fact, you hear people now voice regrets about it. But anyway, and that's a, that's an important marker on the north side of Minneapolis. So uh, I, I think of um, 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 the um, the uh, oh gosh, now his name's going out of my head. But you all know what I'm talking about that our Supreme Court uh, uh, judge uh, who's been around for so long. Um, you know, he started off as Minnesota Viking. Uh, Alan Page, who I'm thinking about, Judge Page, um, we can't do anything without recognizing his contributions. Um, and, and he's still here. And, uh, you know, I knew who he was as, as, as a kid. That's how old he is, because uh, he was one of the famed purple people eaters. And so he came back and he contributed uh, to the community as well. Um, I think of Syl Jones and his contribution uh, in art. Uh, you know, we can't uh, talk about Minneapolis without talking about uh, uh, him. Um, um, speaking of sports, um, uh, Kirby Puckett, uh, who passed a while back, is in the Apple's institution on some level. And in fact, he came here and played for the, the Twins, but he was also, I think, a Chicagoan originally. So, you know, he kind of is part of that connection. Uh, but without him, the Twins probably wouldn't, well, they definitely would not have won a World Series. In fact, they've not even <laughs> they, you know, they've not even scratched the surface of a World Series since his days of playing, and um, he was kind of the straw that stirred, stirred the drink on some level. So he should definitely be uh, somebody that's uh, that, that's included when we start talking about, you know, uh, 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 trailblazers and and, and, um, and I think about Archie Gibbons. Um, you know, he was uh, an early developer. Uh, early businessman still around, um, and uh, his contributions to the North Side uh, should not go unrecognized. Uh, I think the uh, history, the, the history uh, center, uh, the cultural center that's in the uh, I don't know what they're calling that building now in the corner, Penn and Plymouth, but um, um, I think you know, some of his work is recognized there uh, as well. Uh, we think about art. Uh, I think of Lou Bellamy. Um, and uh, what, what he has done with Penumbra, to Penumbra, um, and I think about August Wilson, obviously, um, who was another transplant, and, uh, you know, he's a part of Minnesota Lower. I've, in fact, uh, I, I've seen, I saw all his plays at Lou Bellamy's place, the Penumbra, so they, they should not be left out. Um, and as I'm sitting looking, um, as I, I was thinking about uh, Judge Lejeune Lang, her and Judge Pamela Alexander are also, I think, a crucial part um, um, of sharing um, uh, a crucial part of uh, Minnesota Black history. Um, uh, those both judges challenged things while sitting on the bench. They didn't just sit there, but they actually advocated for black, black people, especially black young people. Uh, I'll never forget Pamela, uh, Judge Alexander's uh, uh, advocacy uh, for uh, a, a leveling of the drug laws, as you know, how unequal drug laws were, especially when it came to crack cocaine for a while. And I, in fact, I remember us writing about it because I've been at the spokesman on and off now. In fact, I was the editor, spokesman, first time I was editor was in 1991. 
That's, yeah, that's how long I've been around. And so then when you ask me about Minneapolis history, I kind of get cheated a little bit because I've been here for a long time and I've seen it through the eyes of people, as Tracy said, you know, having to actually write the stories about people. So some of the stuff I literally remember, right? Uh, because I was there or helped write the story. Um, so all those folks have to be included. Um, I think we also have to uh, include uh, the contribution of a person like Dr. August Nims. Uh, we think about educators and, 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 and academics. Um, you know, he's been in, in, this, in the Twin Cities for a long time and has been a part of, of movements. Uh, you know, he was, took part in the uh, anti-apartheid movement. He's been supportive of the rights of, of Cuba and that kind of thing. And, 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 and that's important because Minneapolis has been a place known for his activism. Um, as you know, I'm an activist. I've been one for a long time. Um, and um, when I, I said in my bio that I've been taking part in, uh, in a lot of different struggles, answer the call, uh, because I think unlike a lot of other cities, uh, activism became part of uh, uh, an accepted part, not as much anymore. But uh, for the folks who've been around, I'm looking at Vivian, so she know what I'm talking about. Uh, the people have been around, there was an expectation, right, that people would respond when folks were in trouble. You know, we were losing that a little bit, but there was used to be, if you got out, if people saw you being active, somehow folks found your phone number, and they called you and said, hey, well, can you help us over there? We're having this struggle over here. Our landlord's not doing us right. You know, can you, can you help us? Uh, you know, I remember uh, uh, local folks organizing around job. In fact, uh, I don't know if people remember when there was a Carson Pierce Scott, Perry Scott here in the 90s, uh, and there was a boycott. It's like the spokesman actually uh, um, helped put forth the boycott because they were mistreating people on a regular basis. And it came to a head when they accosted uh, University of Minnesota, Black University of Minnesota professor. And uh, they, they, they kind of embarrassed him in front of everybody. Uh, they almost strip searched him in the, in, in the department store, you can imagine that, and people rallied around that. Uh, and so, so, that, so we, we have a history, so that all that, and that's why Nellie Stone Johnson, Nellie Stone is important. And so we, you know, we weave all that and we've had a whole lot of folks that have played different roles. And so anyway, so I'll wrap up by saying that I think that uh, uh, it's important that all these people that I mentioned, and I'm sure, oh, if somebody had mentioned that they left out, that's really important. Jim Cook uh, ran some bath in the community center for a long time. He was a good guy. Anybody knew him knew he was a good guy, right? And he ran some bath in the community center um, and, and in fact, uh, as I'm mentioning him, I'm, I'm leaving out his partner, who's had the street named after him, uh, uh, who's along with, uh, uh, you know, our publisher's uh, um, um, mother, Leonie, uh, not mother, but grandmother, Leonie Q, Q. Newman, she's had a street named after her as well. Uh, but, but Jim Cook worked with her and they... Uh, um, they made Sebastian Community Center a real community center. Not to say it's not now, but in the old days, like on the south side, if you were, everything seemed to go through the spokesman or the uh, or Sebastian. There was some big thing going on. There would be a meeting at Sebastian Community Center, just like over north. There would be a meeting uh, over, over north, uh, maybe North High. Um, so, and speaking of North High, um, that's a cultural institution too on some level. And I'm hoping that, you know, whatever we do would acknowledge that. In fact, it's one of my proudest moments because uh, I was one of the people who helped organize along with students and alumni and community members to keep North High open back in, ooh, it was a long time ago now, but I think 2009, they threatened to close, 2010, they threatened to close North High. And they did not because unless it be, this should be definitely on a placard, one of those signs that the community members organized because the superintendent challenged us. I'll never forget it as long as I live. She was a black superintendent, and I'm not going to say her name. But she said, listen, since you guys are so, you guys are so serious about challenging us and you think the school should, should survive, then you tell us how it should survive and what it should look like. And I'll never forget, uh, over 150 of us gathered at Zion Baptist Church, and that's another institution too. Uh, and we gathered at, at, at Zion Baptist Church and we designed a school. Somebody has the paperwork. In fact, Carrie Phillips has the paperwork. And, I'm, and speaking of Zion, uh, we can't forget Reverend Curtis Heron. He was, he, when we talk about uh, the spiritual aspect of, of the development, Reverend Curtis Heron was an institution. He was like very few people you see now. Well, you've seen some people. He was our, our Jesse Jackson on some level because, you know, he was a, uh, a pastor, 
and someone who actually stood up. Yeah, I can remember coming to the church, and in fact, I can remember saying, uh, hey, man, we're, we're trying to, we're struggling this issue. We're going to place a meet and calling the pastor and said, yeah. You, can meet. you always, anytime you ask them if you can meet at the church, you would say yes. Anytime there was some big event, there was an injustice, you called on Pastor Curtis Aaron, and he would get along. In fact, along with some uh, his church members, they would come out and support us. In fact, when Tyson Nelson was shot in the back by Don May, um, he was, him and his congregation came out and supported the young people and the rest of us that they were fighting to get uh, justice for him. So, uh, so that's another, another person who should definitely uh, be included when we Put up these markers, so um, so that's my two cents. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mel Reeves. Um, Angela. Thank Mr. you, Angela Rose Myers. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Antonia. Um, it's so wonderful to see you. And uh, for those who might not know, um, it was uh, Judge Lejeune Lang and Dr. Antonia that have brought to the University of Minnesota the idea of taking the uh, Fourth World Conference on Remedies to Racial and Ethnic uh, and Economic Inequalities to Victoria, Brazil. And they were such uh, so fantastic in spearheading um, um, international relations between Black Minnesotans and Minnesotan leaders here and in Brazil. And, you know, it's that type of um, community building that is so important and so crucial. Uh, and uh, Dr. Antonia uh, got her PhD also from the University of Minnesota. Um, and we have some uh, University of Minnesota folk here, some international uh, members uh, that are at the U here tonight, too. So I'm so happy happy and I wanted to highlight that to um, the those who are uh, putting on this um, conversation as well so that our university uh, students also can see the uh, legacies and the histories and the important people that are on the call right now. So thank you so much. And I'll uh, jump into um, my presentation. If I could have the first slide, please. So hello, everyone. My name is Angela Rose Myers. Yes, no, go back, go back. The no, first slide, go back. There we go. My name is Angela Rose Myers, um, and I'm going to be giving a brief 20-minute, uh, I guess, presentation on Black history in Minneapolis. And this uh, presentation is going to be through the lens of um, really situating Minneapolis NAACP history. So I'm the president, current president of the Minneapolis NAACP, but also situating um, black history as it relates to the University of Minnesota and situating it in places that we are familiar with. Um, so I think that a lot of times how we tell our stories and our oral histories um, can almost be uh, um, uh, uh, removed a bit from the locations, but the locations are still very present here and they're still very much a part of um, our history. I'm a believer that the land doesn't forget and our land doesn't forget those who have come before us and our ancestors who have come before us when it comes to the work and the sweat equity that they have put into this state to make it the great state of Minnesota. So I'm going to ask uh, you all to, uh, to go to the next slide. If I have the next slide, please. So who am I and how did I come to this space? So I am a daughter of two strong black uh, professors and uh, my parents, Dr. Samuel Myers Jr. and Dr. Sheila Ards, they came to Minnesota in the 1990s um, to pursue uh, basically a better uh, a job, right? A better opportunities for themselves and for their children. So my father, he is the director of the Roy Wilkins Center um, at the University of Minnesota. And my mother, when she uh, first started here, she was working at the Humphrey and then um, she went down to South Carolina and I went with her for a couple of years. We lived in South Carolina, Columbia, South Carolina, where she was the uh, vice president um, of a historically black college down there. And then we moved back to Minnesota to be with my father. And she was the associate vice president at the University of Minnesota in, uh, for a couple of years in the early 2000s. 
So um, I came to Minnesota basically growing up as a very, very young child and then coming back at around the age of eight or nine and growing up and spending the rest of my adolescence absent one year where I lived in Beijing, but um, the rest of my adolescence in uh, Minneapolis. And I went to Breck schools, which is a, you know, predominantly white private school in Golden Valley. And how I grew up was definitely being um, very much the only one, the only black girl in class, one or of two maybe. And yet also I saw through my parents a connection of a strong black community that was here. So, you know, it was so crucial for my upbringing that my parents brought me along to things. They made the connections um, to, you know, different legacy makers, whether it was Josie Johnson or Keith Ellison or whomever you know, they were the brokers for my own knowledge of myself and of Black people here in Minnesota. But I didn't see in locations as much the Black history that Minnesota held. And so when I went to Columbia University, Barnard College, which is a woman's college, I, you know, felt in a ways, again, a single black woman in an all white space. I felt like an other and an imposter on an Ivy League college campus. And yet one day um, in my first semester at Barnard, I was walking through the halls of the uh, main Barnard Hall and I look up and I see this plaque and the plaque is the one that I have here on the um, presentation. And it says in commemoration of the last public speech of Malcolm X given on February 18th, 1965 in this gymnasium. And when I saw that plaque, it, I, it sparked something in me. It was a curiosity. I said, wow, I didn't know that Malcolm X had spoken at Barnard. Nevertheless, I didn't know that his last full public speech was at Barnard campus. And in that moment, I went from an other, an imposter, to someone who was interested in the Black legacy that I was, uh, you know, walking in, right? So all of the spaces that we inhabit inherently have a legacy tied to them. But because of white supremacy erasing our history, sometimes we do not know the ancestors that walked before us, the memorialization of those spaces. And we deserve and we deserve to know that history. And we deserve to feel a sense of belonging in where we are in every space. And that comes to, you know, when I graduated from Barnard, I, you know, I was so happy to have tapped into uh, the Harlem community, tapped into my sorority, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, uh, the first Black uh, sorority, and also all of these Black organizations. I was president of my sorority, president of the Black Student Association at Barnard. And I was so happy to make that connection. When I came back to Minnesota, I felt again a little bit of a loss. I didn't know, I didn't know fully, and I didn't know the journey that I had to start to find the history of black folk in Minnesota. And it's very, it's very trite. Sometimes I say uh, in my speeches, right, after the protests and things like that, Minnesota used to be a 0% white state. And then in the year 2000, the census said it was an 86% white state. So to go from 0% to 86%, there is a level of violence that was necessary. And then also an erasure of the black folk that lived um, here in this state. So Dred Scott being one um, of the folk who lived in this state at Fort Snelling, but also a number of Native American um, tribes who were murdered and uh, experienced a genocide at the hands of the uh, at uh, the hands of the United States government just for this territory to become a state. So to conceptualize why when I was growing up, I felt like the only one, I was that not just because black people didn't want to move to Minnesota or something like that, whereas black people were here, but white supremacy erased their presence, erased their history. And then a lot of times the reason why there weren't as many black people as you would say in a Detroit or a Chicago was because of the history and the legacy of a 
uh, exclusionary tactics and violent tactics against the black folks that were uh, moving here, like in Hastings, Minnesota, or in um, multiple instances of um, racial covenants and housing and things and redlining, things like that. So that is the context under which I wanted to give this presentation is not only that the historical black historical uh, sites that we're talking about are not just sites that of which just happen to pop up and their per perseverance in our um, imagination and our knowledge and our legacy and our history is not just of happenstance, but through the intentional uh, resilience and the intentional um, revolution against white supremacy. So, you know, if white folks wanted, if white folks had wanted it, these sites would have never existed and then they would never have been remembered. So that's why we have to be even more intentional now to remember and to preserve these sites. Can I have the next slide? And so that's one of the things too. So this is actually, um, if you know that uh, this was put up, a mural put up outside um, the Urban League and uh, the what was formerly called the Thor Building in North Minneapolis it says Black Lives Matter. And this was a memorialization of one of the you know avenues, um, well-known avenues in North Minneapolis last year. Uh, well, I guess, yes, last year in 2020 after the um, uprising and the murder of George George Floyd, we have to go from a pre uh, a reactive action when we find out that our legacy uh, sites, our cultural legacy sites are about to be uh, uh, torn down to preemptive. And so knowing the preemptive, knowing that these sites are still here and that we need to intentionally um, we need to either buy the buildings, buy the land, you know, really intentionally make sure that there are historical designation, intentionally, you know, even pour into people and give people their flowers while they're here with us. Instead of having to constantly reconstruct histories is so crucial to what I do. And I want to say this as um, being Minneapolis NAACP president, as activists and as black folk in Minneapolis, there's a constant barrage of things happening to black people in this city. There's a constant barrage of white supremacist violence that's happening in this city. And to take a moment to breathe and also appreciate those places that give us joy, that give us more than what we initially thought we could have, those are the spaces and places that we need to preemptively give to and proactively ensure that they are not just, uh, you know, a fall and down building 10 years from now, but that they are thriving and able to grow and build bigger and bigger so that the spaces that we inhabit now, even thinking about like a Sammy's Avenue eatery, you know, we need to give into those spaces so that it's not you know, when I'm old, old and gray, I go to these places and say, wow, this building used to be great. No, you want to go to the places and be like, oh, wow, they were so, whoever, you know, intentionally poured into this space, intentionally kept it just as when I was younger, just as, you know, what it should be um, seen as for our future generations. So may I have the next slide, please? So in doing a little bit of my history for the Minneapolis NAACP, I'll say, and this probably for Mel Reeves and um, Judge uh, Lang and some of the others on the line, this might be a little bit of a sad uh, truth. So um, the sad truth is, is that the Minneapolis NAACP, we unfortunately have lost our history book. Um, and so the un uh, official, unofficial history record of the Minneapolis and AACP is uh, probably in somebody's attic somewhere. Um, but that also means that current members and young folk in the uh, branch, we do not have a constructive year by year history or even um, full list of all the presidents of the branch. And so when I found this out around a year and a half ago, this started my journey to reconstruct the Minneapolis and AACP history. Um, and in reconstructing Minneapolis and AACP history, I've come across these historical locations that I wanted to highlight in tonight's presentation. 
So um, Minneapolis NAACP was founded in 1914. And one of the main founders actually is Gail Heiler. Um, so a uh, Gail P. Heiler was an uh, important trailblazer in Minnesota and also, um, you know, friends with like Frederick McGee, the new W.E.B. Du Bois um, and, you know, Booker T. Washington. And so uh, this was someone who was not only locally recognized, but someone who had connections nationally and you could even say internationally to black thought leaders and activists around the world. So um, one of the main founders of the Minneapolis NAACP, which was recognized, well, our founding documents uh, state February 3rd, 1914, and um, was adopted and recognized by the National NAACP June 16th, 1914. The, uh, air, the area where it said that these first meetings were taking place, the initial meeting place was 2817 Chicago Avenue in Minneapolis. Now this is currently, um, you know, the Children's Hospital. So, it, you know, the building or, you know, the space, I don't know if it was someone's home. It could have very likely been somebody's home. Um, but the meeting area is no longer in existence, but still that is a space where our initial meetings of the Minneapolis NAACP took place. Um, and so the in the early years of the Minneapolis NAACP, we were focused on building infrastructure of the branch by gaining membership and fundraising. There was baby pageants, there was mass meetings, there was, um, you know, at every meeting, there was songs um, performed, poems performed by black uh, poets. So, you know, it was really a group uh, that met at local churches at Phyllis Wheatley um, Gymnasium and the Phyllis Wheatley yeah. Center, and sometimes people's homes. And so this was really a community organization. And the community members wanted to go and meet in different areas areas, as well as a really see what the needs of the community were. And so with that, you know, um, we met uh, at um, one of the early, early uh, first cases of Lena O. Smith, which was uh, mentioned earlier, was the home was the case of A.A. A. Lee. And so the home of A.A. A. Lee is on uh, 4600 Columbus Avenue. A.A. A. Lee was a postal worker that uh, this was in 1931. Um, it was a postal worker that purchased a home in an all white neighborhood in South Minneapolis. Um, white Minneapolis residents tried to protest his moving into his home through stones at his home killed his dog um, while living in the home um, the you know while this family with their six-year-old daughter was living in the home and this was actually a couple of years after Nellie Francis um, had moved into an all-white neighborhood in St. Paul so this was very much at the same time in the case of Nellie Francis actually the Klan burned a cross on her front yard. So the violence um, that the uh, the Lee family could imagine was definitely in their internal registry. They had seen, people had seen what had happened to Nellie Francis's home where a cross was burned on their front lawn. So that was very much of the same type of violence that the Lees were facing. And um, with that, you know, uh, Lena O. Smith, who was the first black woman lawyer in Minnesota, as well as the first black woman president of the Minneapolis NAACP, she took on the case to represent the Lee family. Um, and also with that, um, uh, the Lee, A.A. A. Lee, he was a postal worker and an interracial group of postal workers um, at, of, of the U.S. Postal Office actually took turns protecting his home. So the home that um, we are talking about still stands. And with that, it's so crucial to recognize while the this family was experiencing and facing a barrage, a daily barrage of violence, they were also experiencing a daily uh, 
a daily protection from an interracial group of white and um, Latino and black men who would, uh, not as many Latinos back in this time and era, but um, there is a, actually a, a little bit of a history of Latinos in the postal service in Minnesota, uh, my husband's father being one of them, um, but that's an aside. But it was an interracial coalition of 200 um, members, um, you know, that were outside of the home, uh, as sometimes, you know, uh, arranging to protect that home. And then it still stands, which is a, a, a testament to their resistance. So um, the Phyllis Wheatley Gymnasium has to be 100% um, uh, recognized as a source for particularly their, um, the, sorry, I'm hearing a little bit of background noise, but, um, but the Phyllis Wheatley Gymnasium. 100% had mass meetings. The NAACP held multiple, multiple meetings initially, particularly around the Scottsboro, uh, Scottsboro Boys trial. So the Scottsboro Boys were nine men, black men in Alabama who were accused of uh, raping two white women. Um, and there was an all white jury and they were trying to cast an all white jury. Well, the Minneapolis NAACP actually raised funds for the Scottsboro Boys for their legal fees and then also for the fees of the family um, that they left behind. So um, the co community members, it was very uh, interracial um, uh, uh, community members, over hundreds of community members met at Phyllis Wheatley Gym led by Lena O. Smith to focus their attention on the Scottsboro trial. They were uh, they actually created and sent copies to President Franklin D. Roosevelt. They sent it copies of, you know, the meeting and their issues around the Scottsboro trial to their senators, their Congress people, the mayor and the city council of Minneapolis. And they raised at the time this was again in um, 1930s, they raised over $100 um, for the Boys Defense Fund, um, and then also discussed many issues pertaining to race and rape and the allegations of rape um, that Black men particularly faced in the South and, uh, and, and when facing lynchings. As well as um, at uh, Phyllis Wheatley Gym, they uh, so this was at the same time, actually about a decade after 1921, when uh, the in Duluth, the three men were uh, lynched in Duluth, uh, Minnesota, three black men who were lynched in Duluth accused of uh, raping um, a white woman. And it was the Minneapolis and AACP that went to Duluth then as well, raised funds and went to Duluth then to, um, actually there was five men who were accused of the rape, but three were lynched. Um, and the Minneapolis NAACP uh, held the legal fees and also for, um, uh, legally res represented the other two young men. So that's a little bit of um, what the, the use and the importance of Phyllis Wheatley. And I really hope to proactively push that one on because Phyllis Wheatley is such a testament in our community. Um, the uh, Dr. Robert Cyril Brown home, I'm still trying to find Ro uh, Dr. Robert uh, Cyril Brown was one of the first uh, NAACP presidents and he was also the first black doctor in uh, Minnesota. The home of Lena O. Smith is already on the historical registry and that is on 3905 Fifth Avenue. And I also wanted to highlight not only places where um, you know, the testaments to black hope and resistance is also at times testaments to white violence um, and discriminatory practices. So the Nicollet Hotel and um, refused to serve black customers. Um, and Lena O. Smith actually had taken on a case um, against the Nicollet Hotel. And um, I believe that she had one on the Nicollet Hotel. There was one with um, McCants Stewart and McCants Stewart actually um, in Minneapolis, he had gone to a Minneapolis restaurant and he had been denied service and told by the uh, white owner, if I wanted black people here, I would just hire them in the back. Um, and there was a, a number of accounts of that and the Minneapolis judge and court and jury only took 15 minutes for deliberation to decide that that was discriminatory. 
And that was during, um, there was a very early civil rights act in Minneapolis, in Minnesota. So that was a, a test of the early civil rights acts in Minnesota that were in the early 1900s. So um, the Nicollet Hotel was one. And then the Pantages Theater in 1916 was another where they refused to seat um, uh, Lena O. Smith and four uh, young black men who were with her who had wanted to go to see the vaudeville at the time is a vaudeville uh theater and i would actually really like to see where they sat and have just even at the Pantages theater which is still you know standing today and open and showing plays you know like this is a, a place where at one time black folks were refused service and this is where you know 40 years before rosa parks refused to get up lena smith refused to stand up as well so that is um something to to note um, yes, also uh, the 20, uh, 2417 Fifth Avenue South in Minneapolis. Let me see. That one, I think, um, was the McCants, McCants Stewart area, but that's been torn down now. That's where the thriving building is in downtown Minneapolis. And then I also wanted to, um, and also McCants, um, uh, McCants Stewart was at the University of Minnesota Law School. Um, and he was, I think, one of the first lawyers, uh, one of the first lawyers who passed the bar in Minnesota, but he definitely was one of the first lawyers in Oregon. He moved to Oregon after uh, Minnesota. And yes, it was the 1897 state civil rights law that he tested. And um, that's uh, one of the one of the parts of legal history that we also um, need to recognize is that Minnesota had an anti-lynching bill in the early, um, after the uh, lynching of the three black men in Duluth, they had a, a, a anti-lynching bill. They had the 1897 civil rights uh, law on the books, but yet, you know, we're, now in 2021 and we're still trying to push uh racial equity uh, bills passed so th there's there's a little bit of a you know maybe how far have we gone is the question and then the fourth precinct occupation in uh, 2015 um, mr mel reeves uh, uh addressed this a little bit earlier about the fourth precinct being the way building um which was a point of activism um for young folk and for minneapolis and double acp but also after the murder of jamar clark in uh 2015 um there was an occupation by activists and some minneapolis and double acp members so those are some areas of Minneapolis and NAACP history. If I can have the next slide, and I'll go quickly uh, with uh, the historical sites of the University of Minnesota. Phyllis Wheatley House. Uh, so the Phyllis Wheatley Community Center started as the Phyllis Wheatley House as a settlement house. And in the history of the segregated housing at the university, Kaufman, um, President Kaufman, which now uh, Kaufman Memorial Union is named after, he was a segregationist. And so at first, um, when Phyllis Wheatley House was a Sullivan house, uh, black students would stay there and they could not stay at the, uh, that was one of the only black allowing and university approved housing. So the university had a system where they had to approve the housing of students and graduate students. And so if you were a student who uh, did not get into graduate approved housing or university approved housing, that could put your own place at the university at stake. And there was very few, very few places for black students could live. Phyllis Wheatley House was one of them. Um, and also at the Kaufman Memorial Union, um, the black students and a number of students at University of Minnesota wanted to rename the student union, uh, which is now named after Kaufman, who is a segregationist. And one of my things is, is that, well, the University of Minnesota has decided that they want to keep that name. Well, let's also, if you are going to memorialize someone, memorialize their full history. And so this might be something that we also um, put and memorialize as well, is that he was a segregationist and the acts of violence that he perpetuated against black students, um, particularly even um, having uh, folks from and administrators from Howard University uh, writing to, um, 
the University of Minnesota around their segregation policies, having Roy Wilkins, who is a graduate of um, of the University of Minnesota, and at the time, the uh, secretary, executive secretary of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People on the national level, um, wrote to uh, President Kaufman. So have those letters there as well as you're displaying his name and his legacy of all the great things that he's done. Let's also have those things as well of his true history and his true true face when it came to the many black students that um, attended the university. And that's also where uh, they created an international house where it was a segregated cooperative housing for black male students. And this was actually on um, Washington Avenue Southeast, so really close to the Humphrey um, and a building owned by the university. I don't know particularly where it is, but I could uh, kind of maybe we could have to investigate that more. That's a point of more investigation. And then the Morrill Hall takeover. And so with Morrill Hall, you know, that was something that happened in 1969, um, where African American students uh, took over Morrill Hall at the university's bursars and records office um, to protest the hostile campus environment towards black students and the absence of African American studies department. And the, uh, you know, protest became known as the Morrill Hall takeover. But this really, you know, stemmed out of some of the uh, reactions that the university had to black students organizing on campus in the late 1960s and particularly um you know some of the things of wanting some demands met and some of you know in 1968 there was the plymouth uprising um as uh, mr mel reeves had said this is a continuation of the uh, of that uh, student activism, youth activism, and the three demands that the uh, students had wanted was an establishment of an Afro American Studies department um, by the fall. A contribution by the university of half of the expense for their black conference they wanted to hold a black student conference and then a transfer of the mlk scholarship fund supervision to an organization in the black community all of their demands were met but i want to follow up and still find the through line when it comes to this mlk scholarship fund the university recently started a george floyd memorial fund and i'm trying i want to find the through line when it comes to not only that, but they also had a um, another fund, I think, for Wheaton, who was the first black uh, law student that graduated from the U. So there's some through lines where the university had in the past promised scholarships to black students. And I want to make sure that in the present that those uh, uh, contributions and those promises are still being upheld. Uh, in 1992, the Roy Wilkins Center, named after Roy Wilkins, who had graduated from the U, was started. And that's at the uh, Humphrey School. And then in 2020, the Josie R. Johnson Community Room was opened. Um, and then in 2012, the Huntley House for African American students, named after uh, Huntley, who was one of the uh, protesters in the 1969 Morris, oh, Morrill Hall takeover. Um, so the, the university created African American housing. <laughs> Uh, for African American men named after Horace Huntley, and this is where Huntley House is. So as we're talking about continuously uh, thinking about how we're going to preserve our future, this is some areas and spaces on the university's campus today that uh, Black students and Black community members, particularly the Josie R. Johnson Community Room, was fundraised for uh, the reason for community organizations to have a space at the university. This Josie R. Johnson community room, because I was there when they were fundraising for it, I got to know they want community organizations there. So it's so important. And Josie R. Johnson, she's still alive. She's still here with us. She wants community to tap into that space. That's a space that community members, we are entitled to utilize and we ought to fully utilize that at the U. And so that's at the that's on the West Bank at the Humphrey School, right off of the, um, the Green, 
green line of the Metro Transit. So it is very close to um, uh, public transportation. Not all uh, of the of community community areas are close to public transportation. So this is a, an opportunity as well for community organizations. And then I have Mr. Uh, Mr. Wright here, uh, John Wright, who recently retired. He was a professor at the Afri uh, African American Studies um, and that he's in front of Morrill Hall. He was also one of the students um, who took over uh, the camp, the Morrill Hall. And then he became a professor at the university. He has been a fantastic advisor to so many black uh, students at his tenure there. So he's someone also who um, deserves his flowers. If I could go to the next slide, please. So these are some locations in need of proactive preservation and recognition. Uh, 314 Hennepin Avenue and the potential Gateway Historic District. Um, this is uh, a, a space that came to me basically because of elder organizing. The elders came to Leslie Redmond, former president, and myself. And they said, we're being moved out. <laughs> we're being moved out of this uh, place of our homes. Why are we being moved out? And uh, are they gonna tear this down? If they tear it down, we're gonna be angry because this is uh, the former location of the Archie Givens atrium. Um, and Archie Givens was a, a real estate developer, I guess uh, you could say in uh, the uh, 1950s, essentially, um, with Archie Givens, um, he uh, had at the four, four th 40,000 block of Fifth Avenue South, um, it's now called like the Tilson Built Historic District. He and a Jewish man um, bought land and built homes for African Americans. And so um, these were homes that, to be owned by African Americans uh, so that folks and uh, black folks in Minneapolis could own um, homes. And so Archie Givens um, and his work in those homes particularly should be um, uh, definitely preserved. And the Archie Givens atrium at the um, senior uh, home facility at 314 Hennepin Avenue should be preserved. And also this was the former re residence of Nellie Stone Johnson, um, who Mr. Mal Reeves talked about earlier, so I won't go too deep into her. Um, and with this to um, with the 30, 3, 314 Hennepin Avenue, this is in an area that of uh, rapid development in Minneapolis. So then we have the the Anglis home at 4238, which is the first integrated home, nursing home in Minnesota that uh, Archie Givens also um, initiated and built. We have Station 24, which is the first black, uh, fully black um, fire station. Um, the uh, Flagstad and Central Avenue restaurant is, uh, I need to find if that's still there, but that's where McCann Stewart uh, was uh, discriminated against. Bethesda Baptist Church, uh, the oldest uh, black Baptist, uh, oldest black, uh, not one of the, it's one of the oldest, one of the oldest black Baptist church and uh, the Twin Cities and also a point of Minneapolis uh, NAACP organizing, Sabathony Center, the Glover Soda Center, which is the Urban League now. Uh, the Twin Cities Urban League uh, encompasses that space, but that's also a space where we need to pour in and renovate and make sure that it's uh, still up there with the Sabathony Center. George Floyd Square and the Hiawatha Golf Course. And so you can go to my next slide. And so uh, this is all with the idea of protecting our current legacy um, and our co current temporary cultural site. So this was in 2020, uh, Leslie Redman, Minneapolis and NAACP with uh, a number of other community organizations and just, you know, even just some folk from some some folk from the street from the block you know like yeah the community members real community members when there are white supremacists in north minneapolis we organized a 
at first it wasn't armed, but it ended up being an armed patrol of the Black legacy cultural heritage sites um, because we did see white supremacists in North Minneapolis and they were targeting um, volunteers and um, Black protesters, Black activists who are on the ground to the point where volunteers with the Minneapolis NAACP were shot at by white supremacists. Um, and so this is something Thing where this was uh this is Sammy's right this was where we had our basically our um, our central location you know and so um as you see we have an elder there um but during those nights I cannot tell you how harrowing it was to be on the ground and to wonder if our cultural legacy sites in North Minneapolis would survive the uprising and so that's one of the things that we also need to think about when we're um talking about protecting our legacy and contemporary cultural sites it is by any means necessary. So um, I really want to highlight the work that Leslie Redman has done, Nakima Levy Armstrong has done, um, Mr. Mel Reeves, and so many other activists, even when we're talking about the um, the teachers union sends folks down to George Floyd Square and to preserve this space, right? And so there's a lot of work that we must do, but we also have to uplift the folks who are thinking about, actively thinking about our cultural sites right now. And we determine our cultural landscape that our children will inherit. We must be intentional and mindful of the groups and businesses and community sites currently holding space for us and for our community. And so, you know, what do we do next? We have to make sure that we're being active in the current right now, current redistricting talks and making sure that our community sites are also in our wards and in our districts politically going forward so that we have the political power to preserve these sites as well. We need to apply for historical rec recognition locally, statewide, nationally. And then we also need to tell and document our stories. We need to patron Black-owned stores and businesses. We need to help businesses buy their storefronts, buy their land. And lastly, we need to tend to our legacy. Just like farmers, just like gardeners, what we tend to the soil now will bring fruits for further generations for our children and for our grandchildren. Thank you, everyone. That's my presentation. And go to the next slide. Thank you, Ms. Angela Rose Myers. Much appreciation to all three panel members for this gift of knowledge, of wisdom, and so many of the experiences that we're not aware of. I have uh, something I'd like to read before we move to a short survey. Um, that I received from the judge and my apologies and read ahead of time. So I'm going to read this in the past tense because all of you did exactly that. As journalists, as human rights advocate, African-Americans, you both have several years being able to understand current and historic events more accurately. So our thanks because across the state, that's what you have mentioned for us. We know that across the United States, African-American communities, schools, homes, cemeteries, and churches have been flooded, destroyed by fire, urban removal, or neglect. The African-American community in Minneapolis is being asked by the city of Minneapolis, who is funding this community engagement meetings, to identify, as Aaron shared with us, places and buildings that are so seared into the consciousness of the Black community that there should be formal recognition for future generations and visitors. And we have examples because we have had a series of speakers uh, talk about these buildings and what happened in these buildings to us. At the Way Incorporated Central High School, Bryan Junior High, as well as now the Sabethany Community Center, 
Moral Hall that Angela just talked about, 38th Street in Chicago, and Hiawatha Golf Course. In other states like Ohio, the community pushed for permanent recognition of the site where the Kent State College students were shot and killed to be placed on the National Register of Historic Places so that the site could never be altered or destroyed. So our question is, are there sites in Minneapolis that we believe are significant enough for our Black community to protect? We are going to have a short survey, only three questions uh, in which we would like your response because we are seeking ways in which if we are going to preserve, what are ways that we should preserve? The um, survey is going to be posted on the screen and um, there are choices, just short, just three questions and then we get to see the responses, the combined responses. It is anonymous. If you have completed the survey, I would like to call your attention to the chat box. Erin, would you like to talk about it? Sure, so thank you to our panelists for, for sharing their um, ex experiences and their uh, picks for places and people that are important to the African-American community. Um, for anyone else in attendance, if there are additional places you'd like to add to the list, you can feel free to put that in the chat. And then I'll also provide a link to the online submission form that you can flag for the future as you um, reflect on everything you've heard this evening and perhaps talk with others. Um, you're welcome to provide input uh, over the coming months. Thank you. I don't know if we have the responses yet. Did you all have a chance to participate in the survey? Ah, it is. So yes, 100%, it is important to document, honor, and preserve these events, places, and histories. How should we preserve the recordings? 91%. Oh, 100% museums in Minneapolis, and then recordings, then third statues. And the third question also had very high participation. So you'd like to show the next generation, the exhibits, tours of historic homes, African-American registry and museums in Minneapolis. Thank you very much for participating. Um, if there are any questions of these uh, three panel members, we still have a little bit of time and then the judge will close our session. Any question, comments that uh, you'd like to make at this time? Um, I have a, a quick comment. Um, thanks 
um, Dr. Antonia, uh, Judge Lang. Uh, Brother Mel Reeves, I really appreciate that history. I, I wasn't aware of that struggle um, and how the community came together around uh, North High School. And it, it does make me wonder if uh, there was something that could have um, uh, prevented Central High School, uh, which I believe was uh, was Minneapolis the uh, first and oldest uh, high school uh, from being uh, uh, closed uh, back in the late 70s, I believe, or early 80s, because it's for sure that was a uh, cultural center and a, a part of uh, the hub in a thriving community where um, kids from all over were uh, coming to Central uh, High School as a magnet school. So that's one of the many examples as you all have cited of, um, of a place that was uh, important uh, to us uh, as a community. Um, and uh, also, uh, it, thanks for that history, uh, Sister Angela, um, because I, uh, we did uh, grow up in South Minneapolis on 48th in Portland and we were not aware, or I was, uh, let me keep be more precise. I was not a, aware of that history with uh, the Lee family as you um, laid out in your presentation. So that is important to know because uh, as, I, as I said, uh, I wasn't aware of the struggles that it took for us to move south of um, 46th Street or, or wherever that red zone line was back in the day. So all of this is important. It's important for us to uh, preserve it and uh, be able to uh, pass it on so uh, that we know uh, where we came from. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Emory. Anyone else? If you don't mute your mic or you can write uh, something in the chat box. Um, uh, where, where is, um, uh, oh, um, Tra Tracy, I have a quick personal question for you. Um, uh, my, uh, fourth grade football coach was Jack, who worked at the spokesman or did you know him? Um, uh, actually that is my uncle. Jack Jackman. Oh, okay. Coach Jack. <laughs> All right, thanks. Yeah, Coach Jack. Yeah, I knew him well back then. He was our coach at uh, McCray Park. Uh -huh. And we were known as as the the green machine uh, at McCray Park. But those were uh, uh, those are good times um, playing park board ball uh, for McCray Park back in the day. And I still re uh, remember Coach Jack. So he's your uncle, huh? That's my uncle. All right. Yeah. So if you if you see him, tell him I said hello. I get, I will certainly let, give him the message. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate You're it. You're welcome. Yeah. I would like to suggest that um, the academic communities uh, be um, included. You know, there was always a first somewhere. There are 14 colleges and universities and uh, those are useful designations, I think. Vivian, we are working on a list to include academics, including uh, Dr. Geneva Southall yep. and the uh, music, black music educators that worked in academia and in the community. The uh, suggestions are really welcome to send in names so that we make sure we have a complete list. So thank you. Okay. Hello, Dion. Dion has a hands up. Yeah. 
Good evening, everybody. Go um, just an <laughs> FYI, there's an organization out there that deals with redlining. Um, it's called justdeeds.org. If you look in your neighborhood in Minneapolis and you look in, the, they have a map that's out there and it'll show you where people still have the, um, the deeds that are redlined and on their property. So if you uh, a good good neighbor and you see your neighbor has redlining, you can just see if they can remove it. And it's free to have, to have it removed. If you need more information on it, it's called justdeeds.org. And that came out of the Mapping Prejudice Project that Dr. Brittany Lewis was engaged yeah. in. Um, okay. And so that was, that's a really good um, point, as well as, you know, to as we're recognizing, I think, our, the Black history of the upliftment, right, of African Americans in Minneapolis, I also would like to see, you know, any and any recognition of the fact that in um, 1925, Minneapolis had a KKK chapter. And we know this because in Austin, Minnesota, where the conclave, the can clan conclave um, uh, had a mass march, Minneapolis was represented in that march. Um, so, you know, where was their chapter? You know, what are some of these things that, yes, we might want to erase um, from the, you know, we might want to erase from the white, you know, historical perspective to make sure Minneapolis always looks great and fantastic but you know where was that where you know who who were who were the members um you know there they wanted to show at the University of Minnesota birth of a nation film you know did they show it and where where did they show that film you know there are things that have happened in our history that we do need to also memorialize to recognize that minneapolis wasn't always you know the great white state <laughs> you know the, the great liberal uh progressive state that uh currently they they like to um reframe it as the progressive haven right so you know though that's a there's a racist legacy in history that i think also needs acknowledgement and can be even, um, you know, placed forward uh, into the minds and, and into the where people can see um, this is where that happened. Speaking of that, I don't mean to dominate here, but it's so interesting. The national Ku Klux Klan met in International Falls in the 20s. They had specific, you know, groups. They had the women in the KKK. They had two mm -hmm. um, presses, uh, KKK yeah. presses. And that's, you know, also, you know, juxtaposed with uh, the spokesman recorder would be interesting. Where were those uh, presses? And because they had a magazine um, that they, it was, uh, I, I forget the name of the magazine, but it's like the North Star or something, not North Star, like the North Cross, North Cross, um, Guiding Cross or something. So they yeah, where were those? A, excuse me. They also had a what? seminary, interestingly. The Klan had a seminary? That would be the correct. The Klan, yes. Wow. And it was run by a woman named Bishop Alma. Minneapolis had a very active uh, KKK, and then later they had the Silver Shirts, which were the Nazis. So there's always been a, a fringe of extremism that uh, threads through the history of the city. And that impacts us now. Um, last year uh, during the session, the 2020 session, I worked specifically on legislation that would address white supremacist uh, terrorist organizations as designated by the FBI. Um, and their infiltration into the police departments in Minnesota, which the FBI has declared an issue, a national issue, but also an issue. Um, so, and there are 11 white supremacist terrorist organizations that the FBI has designated as terrorist organizations in Minnesota um, to date. So, you know, that is a legacy that continues and there's current policy work that, you know, we should uh, focus on. It did not get passed, by the way. You, you know, 
So we took, put too much emphasis on the, the terror groups and the, the white supremacists and the folks wearing the flags and, and doing other stuff that you can see. Uh, in Minneapolis, the thing that's held back black progress more than anything else is the folks that you that, that aren't up front, that aren't wearing, you know, masks and, and hoods and that kind of thing. We've been victimized by a whole, uh, a whole culture and a whole system that has, uh, when I think that's why I talk about black migration, um, you know, this city uh, did uh, a lot to make sure that, you know, it was that, that white people could, could thrive. And they, when black people came, they didn't, you know, they didn't uh, uh, do the same thing for black folks. So there were a lot of policies and all these major corporations here, part of this, uh, there were a lot of, there were a lot of freaking redlining. There were things uh, undercover you know, people still smile in your face and what have you, and they still weren't hiring folks who were qualified. Um, you know, we had education. I remember when I got here, the educational system wasn't that bad. They slowly but surely began to undermine education, the housing situation. Uh, we got undermined. These weren't people wearing no hoods, uh, you know, and out of City Hall, both in Minneapolis and St. Paul. The police department has always been uh, a place that harbored white supremacy. That's nothing new, uh, nothing surprising. It's always been that. So, um, you know, uh, when we talk about our struggle, you know, it should be one that talks about some of the systemic things that, that left us out. I mean, you know, the other stuff is, is obvious and it's bad, but the, the thing that, that has really caused uh, uh, black Twin Cities to be mired, at least a percentage of black Twin Cities to be mired in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the bottom of the misery index are these policies, subtle and not so subtle policies that have, uh, and again, education is a big one, uh, housing is another one, um, and, and, and finance. You know, we, uh, black people here were thrivers and strivers, and so if the financial institutions would have matched people's desires. We'd have a whole, whole lot more, uh, a lot, a large economic toehold in Twin Cities. Uh, folks have been around here a while know that, you know, because there were a lot of folks who wanted to do stuff, but the financial institution weren't open to giving them loans and that kind of thing. Um, so the the entire Twin Cities was hostile, but with a smile on their face. <laughs> toward the ambitions and advancement of, of black folks. And that, that has to be a part of the story. And you know, time to have time to flesh it out. But as I was sitting there listening, I was thinking, yes, those, those things are, 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 are that stand out. But the thing that I think that really uh, put us in a position that we are were the things that, that kind of difficult to put a finger on, which is why people go, well, what, what race? What are you talking about? Because a lot of it's, you know, you, you can't really put a finger on it. The education thing, you know, the job, Thing you can't, I say, put a finger on, right? But but it's there. Dr. Sam Myers, uh, Ms. Myers' father, writes about the Minnesota paradox. It's very difficult for us to put a finger on it, but it's there. <laughs> and I, yeah, it shows up in the stats. On it, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. it shows up in the stats. You know, every year we're at the bottom, and it, you can't see. Because and the other thing that we have going is that they're smart. You know, a lot of folks through. You know, a lot of people live quite well in Twin Cities. It's a real paradox. You, you make a good point, right? A lot of folks live well, living in the suburbs and doing well. But then there is a, another group of folks, and even a lot of the folks who come late from African countries and other places, they're doing a little better, right? And uh, um, but there's still hardcore groups of uh, pockets of, of poverty, and 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 where those people are like doubly discriminated against. Anyway. Um, that that's part of that history, and and it, the point is that it could have it could have gone a different way. Is is I guess the point I'm trying to make is that they didn't have to necessarily. Nobody had to be at the No one group had to be at the bottom of the misery index here in Minneapolis, where you know the land was flowing with milk and honey when most people got here. Thank you, uh, Judge. Would you like to uh, close us? Hey, does anyone have any other questions? We want to make sure that we've caught everybody. I I want to thank all of our panelists for the very, very uh, interesting, in-depth information that you provided for the discussion and for the opportunity uh, for the community to have this conversation and to be able to continue to reach out to us, send us information, 
uh, write articles, encourage the community to think about these issues because part of this whole history as Angela and as Tracy and as Mel has talked about is uh, getting our focus off the mark, turning uh, communities uh, to instability, into consumers and not being able to be uh, independent and focus and set their own goals. So I think that the more we uncover our history, the more we're going to learn that the early settlers in Minnesota, as I started the evening, had their own businesses, owned their own homes, uh, were able to get educated even if they had to create the institution themselves. And they battled uh, over and over to try to make that an opportunity for the next generation. So we have the opportunity to look at the past, uh, to benefit from the experiences of elders and to pass that along for the future. And I wanted to answer the question about Central High School, why didn't we save it? And the one thing that defeats historic preservation is destruction. So Central High School was closed for at least five years and the Board of Education claimed that there was extensive water damage, so the building had to be torn, torn down. And who leaves the water running for five years anywhere in Minnesota? I ask. So have a good night and thank you. <laughs> good night. Thank, thank you. you so much, everyone. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Judge Loon. Thank you. Dr. Antonio. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Angela. Thanks, Vivian. Thanks, Tracy.